Welcome to Google Cloud AI Developer Relations Virtual Training. This is part four in our junior data science series, and we're going to be covering mobile convolutional networks. My name is Andrew Froelich, and I'm a staff member at Google Cloud AI Developer Relations. So, um, Mobile convolutional networks are different than those that you might run, say, on a laptop or on the cloud. In, because in a mobile or IoT device, the memory is very constrained. And so we're going to talk about network architectures that are specific to memory constrained devices. And in this episode, we're going to be covering mobile net V1 and V2. And we're going to look at how they trade off latency versus size. And I'm also going to point out that we're not covering V3 because V3 was actually designed with the assistance of automatic learning. So these are sort of the last of the human design, fully human designed uh, networks. Uh, SqueezeNet introduced the fire module and the concept of a macro and micro architecture and meta parameters. So we've been talking about that for quite some time. That's where it started, that terminology. And then finally, ShuffleNet that introduced the concept of a channel shuffle. So MobileNet was really one of the very first entries into the mobile convolutional neural networks where a model was specifically uh, designed to fit on a memory constrained device like your mobile phone or an IoT device. And uh, another thing to sort of uh, point out is um, you have to make these models small or compact. And so they don't have the advantage of a large model that has that over capacity capacity and redundancy that gives you the high accuracy. So these are very carefully trained compact size uh, networks to try to get, try to maintain accuracy as close as possible to their larger network counterparts. Now the mobile net V1 architecture also replaced the normal convolution with the depthwise separable convolution to further reduce computational complexity. And if you recall, the depthwise separable convolution was introduced in exception. Okay. So the mobile net architecture incorporated several design principles for constrained memory devices. First, they had a an additional parameter, this would be a meta parameter called the resolution multiplier for more aggressive reduction in the feature map sizes. And then another meta parameter called the width multiplier for a regressive reduction in the number of feature maps, which they also refer to as network thinning. And like exception, they use a depthwise convolution to reduce computational complexity while maintaining representational equivalence. And then finally, the classifier uses what we see now as a continued convention of using a convolutional layer in place of a dense layer for the final classification. So here's a mobile net V1 macro architecture. You have your stem group, you have your learner that consists of a sequence of depthwise separable convolution groups, and then finally your classifier. Now it's in the stem group where you have the meta parameter for the reduction of the input shape, and that's referred to as rho, and we'll discuss that in more detail. Okay, and then uh, likewise, you could further reduce the sort of uh, width of each one of these convolutions um, through another meta parameter called alpha um, that reduced the number of feature maps. And then every group consequently or subsequently doubles the number of filters or doubles the number of output feature maps. Okay, so let's start with the width multiplier. So the width multiplier alpha will thin a network uniformly at each layer. So at each layer, we have our input channels. Uh, let's say if it's unthinned, would be M and N, the number of channels coming in, 
the number of channels going out. So our thinning is just multiplying this constant, which is a value between zero and one times the number of channels coming in and out. And we do that uniformly through all the groups and blocks. Okay, so when we uh, thin it, we look down here, we're reducing the complexity by that value raised to the power of two. So for example, if we took a value of 0 0.75, its complexity would be reduced down to 56%. At 0.5, it'd be 25%. At 0.25, it would only be 6% as complex and corresponding number of parameters as a non-thin one. Now, when they designed the mobile net, they did an ablation study, and they started off with their non-thin mobile net 224, and this 224 does not refer to the number of layers, but actually the input size. So it took an image that's 224 by 224, and it had a 70% accuracy on image net, it had 4.2 million parameters and 569 million matrix multi -add, uh, multiply add operations. And it's important to distinguish between these two numbers. So the number of parameters is going to dictate how big of a footprint is this model going to have on that memory constrained device. Now, if it's an unquantitized model, then every one of these parameters is a float 32, that's four bytes. This is gonna be a 16 megabyte image that's gonna be uh, on that memory constrained device. The number of matrix multiple add operations more or less uh, refers to how many operations occur when you put an image, a, you put it in at the front, right, the input layer, and you drive it all the way, you forward feed it through for a prediction. And that's going to uh, determine the latency time. How long does it take for the model to come back to me with a prediction? Now, in their uh, test, they took a version of that same mobile net and they changed the width factor to 0 0.25, which means it was only 6% as a uh, number of parameters. And it came with an accuracy of 50%. So that's quite a reduction, 20% reduction of accuracy. But it only had 0.5 million parameters and only 41 million matrix multiply add operations. So that's a reduction by a factor of 10. Now, the second meta parameter reduced was the resolution multiplier or row, which thins the input shape and consequently the feature map sizes at each layer. And conceptually, it's just a resize operation if you think about it. At the input to our, um, to our uh, <laughs> convolutional neural network, if I half the size of the image, those corresponding feature maps that I generate are going to be a lot smaller and that is going to continue all the way to the end of the neural network. So again, it's a value between 0 and 1, and it too will reduce the computational complexity by a, a power of 2. So in their studies, they took a, again, comparing it to a non-thin one, or one with the full resolution as well. If you recall, it had 70% accuracy. So they did a 0.25 resolution multiplier. That means that these input images were only 6% of the original size here, yet it maintained 64% um, accuracy. It was only a loss of about 6%. Now, thinning the image doesn't really affect uh, the number. It doesn't affect, actually, the number of parameters. So we can see the number of parameters is constant. But because those feature maps are going to be smaller, you're going to have less mul matrix multiply add operations. And it reduced it by about two and a half times to 186 million.
So let's look at sort of a snippet here of how you might write a mobile net V1 using the idiomatic procedure reuse design pattern. So you're going to have a stem function, a learner function, and a classifier function. I've left most of the code out for brevity, but of course coming into the stem is the input. That's your input tensor. You're also going to have this alpha, this it that's that meta parameter that says, how much am I going to thin the network? Then the output of the stem, of course, goes as the input into the learner. And again, you have the alpha meta parameter. How much am I going to thin the network? And then on the classifier, now, in addition to the alpha, you're going to have this dropout. So MobileNet V1 used dropout for regularization. And back in those days, they always placed it right after the bottleneck layer and right before that final classification. And then you see here the argument, the parameter here for the number of classes. So let's go ahead and build this. So we create our input tensor, right? And... It's a mobile net uh, 224, so we start off with 224, 224, but we're going to reduce the size by our row meta parameter. Okay, then that's the input that goes in the stem plus whatever our alpha is for thinning, and then that goes into the learner. Again, the alpha parameter, finally the output from the from that goes into the classifier, and then it's out, that's the output, and then we're going to build a model by instantiating the model uh, object, specifying the input tensor and the output tensor, and it's going to follow all the bindings and build the model. So in a MobileNet uh, STEM V1, when it was designed, it wasn't yet designed with the concept of within the convolution, you could go over the edge of the feature map and sort of into that imaginary space and create that padding, like same where you copy the same pixel values. So they uh, manually padded it using zero padding. So that just meant that the convolutions actually stopped at the edge of the image but because we added some zero padding to it, they stopped at the edge of that zero padding. So the stem um, back then consisted of two three by three convolutions. Okay, the first one was a standard strided convolution um, that, that started with 32 filters. And you notice you have your alpha factor here that you might reduce that number of filters by. So that's your thinning. Okay, so that alpha would do uh, would do a reduction in the number of feature maps coming out. Likewise, since this is strided, that means it's a strided two. Therefore, it's doing feature pooling. Okay, so it's going to reduce the size of the feature maps by one half height, one half width. That's a seventy five percent reduction. And again, because we're doing it as a convolution, it's learning the best way to downsample those feature maps. And then when we get to the next convolution, which is a depthwise separable convolution, it's actually going to double the number of filters, of course, thin by the alpha factor. So that's so that is um, actually doing um, what we call a dimensionality expansion. It's expanding the dimensionality. It's increasing the number of feature maps. Okay, so let's look at how we might write the stem. So we have our input tensor coming in, our alpha meta parameter, how much we're going to thin it. If we're not thinning it at all, that's going to be a one. So we put our padding around the image. Then we do our convolution here. You notice our padding is valid. So we're just going to go to the edge of the image, not over it into the imaginary space. It's strided. So the outputting feature map is one half the height, one half the width. Um, we have 32 filters, but we may further reduce it by alpha, our thinning. And back then, it followed the principle of doing batch normalization after the convolution. And you may notice this little thing here is a ReLU has a number in it. And all in the previous examples, we didn't have a value here. 
Okay. So what this is, is it's a clipping function. And let me explain it this way. So in ArrayLu, if you have a value on below, a negative value, less than zero, it clips it to zero. And basically, zero just means no signal or means I have no confidence that this feature is here. Any value above zero just passes straight through as is. And it's like saying, how confident am I that this feature is here or I've detected this feature. What we found in mobile networks is that they, because they're in a memory constrained device, that range of how confident I am works better if it's constrained or squashed. Okay. And we also found even further that when you quantitize the weights into gener integers, that it will maintain better accuracy if you squash it. And in this case, through practice by researchers, sort of the ideal range they found was between zero and six. So this is the max value. So anything over six just gets clipped to the value of six. And then, of course, our final depthwise block with the 64 filters and our alpha thinning. So let's kind of look at, let's look, take a look at the learner. So this is a microarchitecture uh, picture of the learner that consists of multiple depthwise of uh, separable convolutional blocks. And the first block in a group is always strided. That means it's going to have a strided two. It means that the feature maps coming out of this are going to be one half the height, one half the width. So, um, so this is a block. Blocks are pretty simple in a mobile net V1. They're convolution. Notice they're not a residual block. There is no identity link. Okay, you have two convolutions. You have your depthwise three by three convolution followed by your pointwise convolution, the one by one pointwise. So if you recall in exception, we went into detail how this combination here produces a depthwise separable convolution. Um, and then the filters are then subsequently uh, thin. So N is the number of filters that would have been specified for it, which can be further reduced by your alpha meta parameter, which further thins the neural network. So let's go ahead and just put together a little code snippet uh, for the depthwise block. So coming in is your input tensor, your number of filters that you're gonna have in the block, um, alpha, how much you're gonna thin that. And strides just refers to whether this block is the first block you're gonna do uh, the strided, uh, a strided convolution, which means feature pooling or non-strided. So if it's strided here, of course, it had to do because, again, it wasn't using the concept of padding equal the same when it was designed. So I had to sort of manually put some padding around it. So we have our three by three depthwise convolution here, followed by our pointwise convolution, which is going to output our n number of filters. Oh, and of course, our filters may be further reduced by our thinning parameter. So the classifier, um, what MobileNet v1 classifier uh, today is still fairly conventional, um, except for the dropout part here, okay? So typically what happens is you still have the bottleneck layer, that's this right here, where you do sort of that aggressive reduction on those final feature maps. You're going to convert each feature max map to a single pixel. You're just going to take the full value, the average value to make that pixel, and then make that a 1D vector. So if you had 2,000 feature maps coming in here, you're going to have a 1D vector 2,000 elements long. And then it did a reshape, changing every one of those single elements to a 2D, made back to a 2D matrix, but it's a one by one matrix. That then went through dropout. That's how they did regularization at that time in this model. And then finally, a one by one convolution using a softmax where the number of filters equal 
the number of classes. So every feature map coming out of that is sort of is a one by one with its confidence of per class. And then finally, we reshape that back into a 1D vector. So let's go ahead and look at the code. Take a little water. So we have our input tensor, which is those final feature maps. Our thinning metaparameter, the amount of dropout for regularization, and the number of classes. So here's our bottleneck layer here. We're going to do the global average pooling. We're going to reshape this into a one by one uh, element, one uh, 2D vector. We're going to then do our dropout. We then do our convolution on that. And here is our activation is a softmax, and the number of filters is equal to the number of classes. Then we're going to reshape that back into a 1D vector. So what do we get here? We got that 1D vector. That's the length of the number of classes where every value in it is between 0 and 1. How confident I think this is the right label, and all the numbers add up to 1. Okay, so I'll we'll talk about MobileNet V2. So it's an architecture introduced by Google in 2018 as further improvements to V1. And the author stated that the redesign further reduced computational complexity while preserving representational power, which is the same as representational equivalence, but with increased accuracy for mobile and IoT devices. And the MobileNet V2 re replaces the convolutional blocks with what they call an inverted residual block to improve performance. So now we're going to use residual blocks instead of convolutional blocks, but they change the design of the re residual block, which we'll go to in a minute. So they incorporated several design principles for constrained memory devices. One is they continue to use the idea of the metaparameter alpha for thinning the network. Okay. And they continue to use a depthwise separable convolution in place of a normal convolution. But they replaced the convolutional blocks with residual blocks. And then they introduced this new, not what they call new novel design for a residual block that the authors call the inverted residual block. And then finally, they replace using uh, the one by one nonlinear convolutions, that is, that the one by one convolutions that had the ReLU with a one by one linear convolution which means it had a linear activation. So let's just kind of uh, quickly look at the overall architecture of a mobile net V2. So again, you have your stem group, you have your classifier in between, you have your learner, and then you have this sequence of inverted residual groups. And each group is going to increase the number of filters. And if you... Um, <coughs> So, and then they have this sort of last little thing here. So you have all these groups here, and then they have a single convolution layer at the end that increases the number. So it's a one by one here, which means it's a linear projection, a one by one linear projection. And it's going to increase the number of feature maps four times to 1,280. And because it's a convolution, it's learning the best way or the optimal way to increase the number of feature maps. So uh, we'll take a look at a group within the learner. So every group is a sequence of inverted residual blocks. But the first residual block is strided, meaning that it has a convolution with a stride of two. So coming out of that, the feature maps are going to be one half the height, one half the size. But it didn't occur in every single group. You notice this notation here. It only occurred in the second, third, fourth, and sixth group in the mobile net architecture. So let's go ahead and sort of write the function for group. So here's our group function. Here's our input tensor. Here's the number of filters for the group. The number of blocks that are going to be in the group. 
alpha, our meta parameter for thinning, uh, expansion, I haven't uh, described yet, but it's used in the block. There's a step there where we do a dimensionality expansion. This is how much we're going to do it by. And then finally, whether um, that group is going to start with a strided convolution. So that's what I meant by this. Not every group started with a strided convolution. Okay, so um, presumably the first in inverted block may be strided. So we just call it separately here, passing in whatever the strided values are. So if it is a strided one, it's going to be two by two. If the group doesn't start uh, that way, this is going to be a one by one. And then all the remaining blocks, there it is, and blocks minus one are going to be unstrided. So let's look at a mobile net v2 block now. So this is a residual block. So you have your input. It's going to go through these convolutions, and the input is going to be added to the output. But there are some differences here. So, well, one part that is the same, if you look at a residual block in exception, the 3 by 3 convolution in the middle, okay, is a depth-wise convolution, and that is the same right here, okay? And this more or less forms the pattern that you saw in a ResNet uh, where it introduced the concept of a bottleneck convolution, where you had one by one convolutions on both sides of the three by three. But here, they've inverted it. So in the bottleneck, the first one by one convolution was a bottleneck convolution that reduced, did dimensionality reduction. And the other one was the opposite. It, it did a dimensionality expansion. It was a linear projection. Well, this time they flipped it. So the first one is going to do the dimensionality expansion. And the last one is going to do the reduction. Hence the phrase inverted residual block. Now the, the amount of expansion is determined by this meta parameter uh, that's passed in um, called expansion. And again, the number of output of filters here can be further thin by your alpha meta parameter. So let's go ahead and show the code for this. So here's our inverted block. We have, of course, our input tensor, the number of filters for the block, the amount of thinning, the amount of expansion, and whether that block is going to be strided or not. So the actual number of filters we're going to use in the final pointwise convolution is the number of filters we specify times the thing factor, okay? Um, <clears throat> for the expansion, we need to know the number of channels coming in. So we take our tensor and we look at that last element in the shape. And if you recall, uh, a tensor in a 2D convolution, uh, a convolutional neural network is going to be four dimensions, batch, height, width, channels. So the last one is the number of channels. And if we're doing an expansion in this block, okay, uh, then we're going to do this one by one linear projection, which is followed by our batch normalization, our ReLU, and of course we continue to use uh, this max value where we're clipping the ReLU. Um, again, we've mentioned this many times now. Uh, still, the mobile net V2 didn't use the concept of same padding, so they manually padded it with uh, zeros. Then you have your depth-wise convolution, the 3 by 3 here. And then finally, your linear point-wise convolution. This is where you're going to do the dimensionality reduction. And then finally, you're going to add the input to the output. Okay. So SqueezeNet is an architecture introduced by joint research of DeepScale and UC Berkeley and Stanford University back in 2015. And in the paper, corresponding paper, the authors introduced a new type of module referred to as the FIRE module. But there are also the paper that first introduced the phrases 
macro architecture, micro architecture, and meta parameters. These things we've been discussing all this time. So meta parameters to remind you is, is basically separating the hyper parameters into two groups. So one group are those are the parameters that are used to train the model, but don't stay with the model. And the meta parameters are those parameters that can configure the model, change the configuration. The macro architecture is the overall architecture, the idea of components and groups and blocks. And then the micro architecture is when you get down to the block. How is that block designed? And what's important here is how automatic learning now works. Because we think of automatic learning now as being two levels, macro uh, architecture search and micro architecture search. So the original AutoML and the corresponding NASNet um, architecture that was learned from it was actually micro architecture search, which is highly, highly expensive and still is today. Macro architecture search is now the more common way of doing. Um, uh, of automatic learning of an architecture where we're going to give it configuration patterns about how to put together the groups and the blocks and try different configurations and it's much much more quicker and cost effective okay take a drink so in SqueezeNet the authors had three design principles so the first strategy was to use as many one by one filters instead of the more common convention of a three by three, which gave them a nine X reduction in the number of parameters everywhere they can make the replacement. So in version V1 of SqueezeNet, they used a ratio of two to one. So that is for every one three by three uh, filter or convolution, there was two one by ones. The next one was to reduce the number of input filters to the three by three layers to further reduce parameters. And they did this uh, as what they call the squeeze layer inside, inside the fire module. And then another strategy was as they delayed downsampling of the feature maps to as late as possible in the network in contrast to the convention of downsampling early to preserve accuracy. Okay, well, actually, I'm saying that wrong. Um, to preserve accuracy in this very memory constrained device, they delay downsampling as long as possible in contrast to the uh, convention in larger amount of, 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 of models of continuously doing downsampling from group to group to group to group. Okay, so let's look at the SqueezeNet architecture. So again, you have your stem, your classifier, and then here's your learner. And your learner consisted of three fire groups, okay? And the fire groups would double, start with whatever their input was, they would double the number of the feature maps on the output. And so here you can say, see the first fire group started with 16 feature maps, which is actually kind of fairly small, and doubled it to 32. The next one starts with 32, dub doubles it to 64. Then the final fire group had this extra step right at the very end. It did the dropout for the regularization. So the uh, STEM group back then still used the concept of a very coarse level uh, filter, a seven by seven, um, though it was strided. So it reduced the size of the feature maps by 75%. Uh, and then it was followed by max pooling, which did another 75% reduction. So you're actually reducing the, the size of the feature maps are now only 6% the size of the input image. So as I mentioned, the learner consisted of three fire groups. The first group had an input of 16 filters and an output of 32. 
The second one doubled that with an input of 32 and an output of 64. And both groups delayed downsampling of the feature maps to the end of the group. And then the third fire group was really just a single block of 64 filters followed by a dropout layer. So here we'll look at a group microarchitecture. So it's going to consist of a sequence of fire blocks. Okay, the first fire blocks is going to have what we call N filters. That's the number of input filters. So an example, the first fire group, that was 16. And only on the last fire block do we then double the number of filters. So that's what's referred to as 2N. And at the end, when we've done the last fire block, then we do the delayed max booming. So here we're going to write a group. So what we have is we have our input tensor and the number of filters. We're going to create our number of specified number of filters okay in the fire block and then we're going to uh, at the very end after we create every fire block we're going to do our delayed down sampling okay so let's actually look at the squeeze net block or what they call the fire module and it consists of two layers a squeeze layer and an expand layer so this is a squeeze layer. It's a one by one bottleneck convolution. Okay, so it's gonna squeeze down, do a dimensionality reduction. Okay. And then the output is gonna be branched to two parallel convolutions. So both of these convolutions will see a copy of the same feature maps. The first one is going to do a one by one linear projection and increase the number of feature maps four times. And the other one here is a three by three convolution. So it's going to do the feature extraction or the feature learning. And again, expand the number of feature levels four times. Those two sets of feature maps are going to be concatenated together. So it's going to be eight times the number of feature maps. So this is my squeeze. This is my expand. So let's go ahead and write a fire block. So we have the input tensor to the fire block and the number of filters in that block. We start with our squeeze layer. So you see the one by one bottleneck convolution right here. We're then going to um, take the output of that and pass it as input to two parallel convolutions here. They're gonna be our expand. So the first one is our one by one linear projection, gonna expand the number of filters four times. Our other one is the regular three by three convolution. And again, expand the number of output feature maps four times. And then these two outputs, we're just going to concatenate together. So this is the SqueezeNet classifier group. It, it kind of inverted uh, these two steps. It still used the convention of using global average pooling for the bottleneck layer and a convolution for, um, for outputting, you know, the, uh, the probabilities, the softmax probabilities. Uh, but here they actually inverted it. First comes the convolution and then comes the bottleneck layer. Okay, then after that, they made some modifications to SqueezeNet and they came up with what they called bypass connections. And if you notice in the blocks, uh, they're all convolutional blocks. There's no residual link. Okay, so what they did is they added some blocks that would have, a, that would actually be a residual block. They called it a bypass connection. And they found that it increased the accuracy of squeeze net by about 2% on image net. And they tried two different versions of a bypass, a simple and a complex. So in a simple bypass, the identity link only occurs in the first fire block of a group and the third a block in a group. So let's go ahead and look at a picture of that.
So this is SqueezeNet with identity link in the fire block. So if you recall this, so this is our squeeze layer. This is our expand layer. There's our concat. But additionally, we're going to make a copy of the input. Remember the input. And we're going to add it to the output here from the concat. Okay, so let's go ahead and sort of write that fire block with a simple bypass. So now it's really a residual block. Okay, so what we're going to do is add this extra parameter, whether it does or does not have the identity link. So we're going to remember the input. We're going to do a squeeze layer here. I kind of left some code out for brevity. We're concatenating the expand layer to one big set of feature maps. And then if it is a bypass, we're going to add the input to the output. Okay, so that now leads us to ShuffleNet. So ShuffleNet is an architecture introduced by Face++ in 2017, and it introduced new layer operations. One of them was the groupwise point convolution, and the other one was the channel shuffle. And the author stated that their design is able to have a large number of feature maps at a substantial reduction in compute cost. So recall, that in, mo that in these compact models, uh, one of the things we did to fit into memory is we significantly reduced the number of feature maps. Um, well, that greatly impacted the accuracy. So they proposed a new design here where you wouldn't have to decrease the number of feature maps as much and yet still have very low compute costs, that is your latency. And what they found is when they compared the shuffle net to mobile net on image net, is they had almost an 8% uh, performance improvement in accuracy. So the architecture, again, has a stem group, a classifier group, and then three, then in the learner, you have three shuffle groups. So a shuffle group um, consists of a sequence of shuffle blocks where the first shuffle block is a strided shuffle block, which again, that means that the output, uh, the feature map output from it is going to be one half the height and one half the width. So writing that, here's a code snippet for just the group. Um, oh, another thing I hadn't pointed out is when we get to the group wise, <laughs> Of uh, convolution, we're going to be breaking the feature maps into groups. And so we need to know the size of each group or the number of partitions. So this is the number of partitions that we're going to use later, the number of blocks in the group, the number of filters for that blocks, and any reduction, in dimensionality reduction. So our first block is going to be a strided shuffle block. And then the remaining blocks will all be this non-strided shuffle block. Okay, so the blocks used a style of a one, three, one style. That means you have a one by one convolution, a three by three convolution, a one by one convolution residual block. The three by three convolution is a death wise convolution just as it is in mobile net which started in exception. But the one by one point wise convolutions are now replaced with what they called a point wise group convolution to further reduce computational complexity. And by further reducing it, they were able to keep more feature maps for higher accuracy. So this is a, a shuffle net block. So you have your one by one convolution, you have your three by three depth wise convolution, and then you have your one by one point wise convolution. You also have this other operation they introduced the channel shuffle in between. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's going to do some shuffling of the feature maps. And then because this is a residual block, you take the input and you add it to the output. Okay, so here's some code sequence for a shuffle block. 
So we're going to have the number of partitions when we do the pointwise group convolution, which we'll go to in a moment, the number of filters for the entire block, and the amount of dimensionality reduction, which is passed to the pointwise <clears throat> the first a uh, pointwise group. So that the first one does a dimensionality reduction and the last one is going to do a dimensionality restoration. In after that and before the depthwise three by three convolution, we're going to do the channel shuffle. So here's a co-sequence for the pointwise group convolution. So first we need to know how many feature maps there are. So this is our input tensor. So we're going to look at the last element of the shape. Again, to remind you, uh, tensors at this point are going to have a four element shape. It's going to have ba your batch size, your height, your width, the number of channels. We want the number of channels, the very last element. So the number of filters in each group is basically is simply the total number of feature maps divided by the number of partitions. Um, the number of output ones is uh, very similar. Okay, so it's going to be <coughs> find this is going to be the number of filters we specify divided by the number of partitions, but we want to round it up. Okay, so for groups, so we're going to split the feature maps into that many partitions. So this is, we're going to use a lambda with a slicing operation. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of Python slicing. If you're not too familiar with it, I encourage you to look up a reference. The important thing is, is that these are NumPy's or tensors. And because of that, slicing them is a matrix operation which can be put onto the graph. So this whole operation is converted to graph operations in the model. Then for every one of those partitioned up groups, we're going to do a separate convolution. And this might remind you of exactly something very similar in the res next with cardinality when we did the split. We took the set of feature maps and we split it into groups. And then the next step was the transform step where every one of those split sets of feature maps went through a separate convolution. Okay, finally, we're going to do all those separate ones. And then we're going to concatenate the feature maps from each one of those groups back together and then our batch normalization. So let's talk about the shuffle. So what is the shuffle? Okay, well, assume these are our input channels. And I kept it simple. There are six of them here. And we're going to split them. And let's say the number of partitions is two. Okay, so we're going to have one set of three here and another set of three. So that's just a split. And that's what you would have seen in a ResNex in the split operation. The channel shuffle then actually reconstructs uh, these the same number of channels, but takes a little bit from each, uh, every other one, okay? Um, so this first one takes a little bit from that, takes a little bit from that one, takes a little bit from that one. The next one takes a different part of this one, a different part of that one, and a different part of this one. And what they have uh, asserted in their paper that by shuffling this way, it increased the information flow across the output channels. So let's go ahead and write a channel shuffle. I'm going to go really quick because it uses a bunch of lambda operations. Um, but uh, what we need to know is one is sort of the uh, group size of every one of these. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to, I'd have you look these up, but basically the really important thing here is this transpose operation. This is the operation here that causes us to go from this to this. Okay. So those are the uh, three architectures I was going to talk about, and I'm going to wrap this up with quantization. So what is quantization? It's a process for reducing the number of bits that represent a number. 
Now for memory constrained devices, one would desire if we could store the weights at a lower bit representation without the significant loss of accuracy. Now, neural networks tend to be very resilient to small errors in calculations. So they don't really need a high precision for inference. We needed that high precision for training, but not for inference. And so the idea here, or the conventional reduction, is to replace our 32-bit floating point weight with a discrete approximation of that 32 two point floating point range with an eight bit integer value. Okay. And one of the primary advantages of this is we go from 32 bits down to eight bits, which requires only one quarter of the memory space for the model. So when we're talking about a memory constrained device, this is very important. Okay. To get down to that smaller size. Okay. So, Kind of how do we do this? Well, we have to take sort of the dynamic range of our 32-bit floating point values. And you got to remember is we can't take the true range, you know, from minus infinity to plus infinity. We're talking about the actual range of values that are coming out of your model. And then we're going to split that into buckets that are for an 8-bit value, that's 256 buckets. One way we could do it is we just proportionally cut each one within that range. But in general, that's not really the way it's done. It's done as a normal distribution. So think of it as the, uh, as, as the weights that are further out and less frequent are going to have a larger band and the values more in the center that are more common are going to have a shorter band. So you're just going to take this range and apply a standardization when you make your 256 buckets. Of course, you don't do that. The software does it all for you. So now, also, what ex there's more types of conversation than just the int. There's also a conversion of float 32 to float 16. And it really depends on your hardware accelerator. So you can do the integer conversion going from 4-byte float to 1-byte integer on a CPU or a TPU. And you typically see a 2 to 3 times speed up. GPUs do not support integer operation. So you can't do an integer quantization if you're going to run it on a GPU. But if your edge device is a GPU edge device, you can convert it from float 32 down to float 16. Okay. And this will mean um, that if you think about it, a 32-bit operation times a 32-bit operation um, and you compare that to a 16 to a 16, you actually can do four times the number of 16s in the same time as the 32. So you're going to get approximately a four times speed up in execution. <coughs> okay. And this is uh, just a reminder here, which I said earlier, quantization works best when in that ReLU func uh, function, you have constrained or shrunk that range to a maximum value of six. So the first step of taking a regular model you've trained, that is a TensorFlow Keras model, which is in a saved model format that's uh, appropriate for running on the cloud, on your desktop, in a laptop, but now you want to run it in a mobile device. You can't actually run a saved model because the environment for running that model is too large to load on your mobile or IoT device. Instead, you're going to load what's called TensorFlow Lite on that device and it's going to have its own interpreter and its own format for the model so step one is we need to convert the model from the saved model format to the tensorflow light format 
that's what this step does. So from the TensorFlow Lite module, I'm going to use the TF Lite converter. I'm going to instantiate a converter and I'm going to use the method from save model. I'm saying, hey, I'm converting from the save model format and I'm going to pass in my model that I have built. That's going to give me a converter for this model. And then I'm going to invoke the converter with the convert method. And that's going to return me the TF Lite model. Okay, so the next step is, is the actual interpreter environment. So again, remember, a TF Lite version of a model is not a TensorFlow save model format. You cannot run it on your desktop as is, <laughs> all right, or as is on your on your edge device you need an interpreter okay so step one is instantiate an interpreter so that's tf.light.interpreter and i'm going to pass in my tf light model and then the next step is is you need to tell it to allocate the memory space for the input tensor and the output tensor and that's what this allocate tensors does and then for prediction, you need to know information about the sizes of that input and output tensor. And the simplest way to do that is to call the interpreter with the get input details and the get output details. And for example, when you got the input details, if you want the input shape, what comes back here is actually a dictionary. So the key shape is going to tell you the shape of the input. You may wonder, why is there another array dimension here with a zero in it? Well, that's because models can take multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And this just corresponds to this. And most of these examples are showing you simple image classification. That's a single input. So that's going to be in position zero. Okay, um, I think I already described that the input and the output details are returned as a list. And of course, they contain uh, the dictionary elements. And I've already pointed out the, the reason why that itself is an array is to handle uh, multiple output, multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Okay, so now we've converted our saved model to a TensorFlow line. We've invoked an interpreter on it. We've allocated the tensors for the input and the output. Now we're ready to do a prediction. So let's just say hypothetically, uh, we're going to do a prediction for uh, a CIFAR uh, 10 image. Okay. And we're going to do it with a batch size of a single image, batch size of one. So that's 132, 32, three. Okay, so the first step is, so let's say from our test data, our, our CIFAR test data, we just take some arbitrary image. Well, that arbitrary image is going to be, what, of size 32, 32 of 3. We got to convert it to a batch. So we have a 1 here. That's what this expand dims will do. Okay. Then we need to tell the tensor um, or the interpreter, this is our input tensor. So we're going to invoke the set tensor and we're going to pass it the data and the keyword here the key here index is what we're saying set the data to the input tensor okay now that it's set we can actually do an invoke okay now this data is forward feed through that tensorflow light model all the way to the end to do a prediction and you notice there's no output here how do I get my output? Well, you got to do a get tensor. So you got to get the output tensor. Okay. And again, the reason we have zero here is that's to support a multiple output model. This is a single output we're talking about. That's why it's in position zero. And that output tensor is returned in the key uh, dictionary entry key index. So what's going to come out of that? Well, it's your softmax distribution. So if we have in CIFAR, for example, that means we're going to have 10 elements. All of them are between 0 and 1, but they add up to 1. And we want the element that has the highest value. That's the most confident label. So we simply do an argmax on that to get 
the label, the position in that array that has the highest value, and that's our label. Okay, so really the next thing to do is batch, okay? Um, in a save model, you don't have to do anything special about a batch. You can give it a batch of one, a batch of a thousand. It doesn't matter. You know, all that matters in TF Light Interpreter because it has to allocate tensors. And by default, it allocates them for a batch size of one. Okay. So if I want to run in batch mode, I have these two extra operations. They're called resize tensor input resize uh another oh this, I'm, I'm sorry about it. this should be resize tensor output that's a typo okay and so i'm going to tell it to resize that input detail at zero the dictionary uh key index i want to make this one a batch size of 128 which also means my output tensor is now going to return not a single uh, 1D uh, vector of 10 elements, but 128 of them. So I have to resize that and then allocate the tensors. Okay. Well, that's our presentation for our mobile convolutional uh, neural networks. And again, uh, thank you for uh, attending or watching our presentation.